This is Star Talk Sports Edition. And this is going to be a Cosmic Queries grab bag. I love those because they go everywhere. And we're responding to your depths of curiosity out there. We're going to do three segments. In the first segment, we're going to do Cosmic Queries. In the second segment, more Cosmic Queries. And in the yeah. third segment, even more. And I got with me my co-host, Chuck Nice. Chuck. Hey, Neil. Oh, what's good that? to have you there. All right. Professional uh -huh. comedian. And I got a former professional soccer player in the guise of Gary O'Reilly. Gary, I feel Hi, privileged Neil. to have you have access to you. Just I, I feel the reciprocal feelings. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. And we said in previous episodes, you there's a wiki page where your yes. legs are on full display. Mm. Oh, my God. And Chuck couldn't stop talking about it. Let I me like tell Daddy you. Grable. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Goog for our listeners, Google that because it's going to go probably way uh, over your head. But there you go. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think I'm pretty good with grab bag cosmic queries, but I know someone out there who's better. We all do. He's beloved, a friend of Star Talk, my friend, my colleague, Charles Liu. Charles. <sighs> Hello, Dude. Neil. It's a Dude. pleasure. And Welcome Chuck and Gary, back. great to see you guys again. Thank you so much. The see crowd you, goes wild. Back. The champion hey. returns. Be because whatever I know, you know more of it. <laughs> that's what. I, that's why. I, not at all, Neil. Not it, it at is, all. It is evidence okay. that the, that the geek spectrum goes infinite in each direction. Okay, wherever you are yes. in it, there's someone geekier than you in arms reach away, and that's what I, we've got right here. I would just like to think that we complete each other. Oh, you that's don't know. That's sweet. I can that's supplement sweet. and vice versa. That's wow. sweet. That's very well, nice. We're recording this right in the middle of the Olympics, and finally, finally, track and field kicked in. Mm. So, um, Chuck, are you on top of that? Yes, absolutely. the uh, The Olympics. I'm uh, I'm watching none of it. <laughs> <laughs> How is that possible? How can you avoid? Uh, okay, Charles. Now, I'll, okay, I'll, I asked I'll the wrong go, person. I'm Charles, gonna be very go, honest. Go, I try. Do over. I, I do can't over. find it. I can't find it anywhere. I'm serious. Uh, do, really? do over, Charles. How have you yes. been doing with the Olympics? Oh, I have been following it. I've been watching some stuff, and I confess that I was staying up till all hours once or twice this past week, just checking things out live because somehow there is a difference between watching something ha happen in real time compared with watching it packaged in prime time. All right, so Gary, Chuck, yes. you, got the, you got the questions out there, so let's see what we've got. Uh, and are all of these right. from Patreon? Yes, they are. Um, I'll start off, Chuck, um, follow up the next one. Jay Maggi, here we go. Is oxygen deprivation a major case with swimmers who train and compete for Olympic gold? What kind of transformation do their bodies go through in being able to push their bodies while getting less oxygen? Okay, mm. Charles, <laughs> over to you. Yeah, Charles, let me tighten that question a little bit and ask sure. you, um, if are the better for athletes better because they do well with less oxygen or because they've done something with their physical fitness so that they always have more oxygen available? Ah. Uh, both are kind of true, and, and I presume varies. it doesn't. It doesn't focus just on swimmers; it's just anybody it's with, with this much major anybody. muscle and, performance. And, and in fact, there is a method of blood doping where you add oxygen, uh, hemoglobin-rich stuff, into your body. So there's a mm -hmm. way to cheat on that too. But oxygenation is a very good question. And yes, wait, wait, wait. If you add if you add oxygen-rich hemoglobin, that's not a separate chemical different from the no. rest of what's but in your body. But if you have a higher percentage of hemoglobin in your blood, then you can process oxygen a little bit better. But and uh, you won't get caught. Right. Yes, well, that, or supposedly, but actually, okay. you can I believe they call that the Keith Richards. <laughs> <laughs> Today you He's still, still can alive. be caught. You, take, you train at altitude, Charles. Yes. You One harvest of the blood. That's yes. Hot, that obviously is able to take in more oxygen. You keep it, knowing that yes. you're performing at sea level, and then you dope. Yes. With, fact, with your um, own blood. With your own blood. Tour de France cyclists are in fact um, um, yeah. infamous for doing this kind of work. But uh, and, and no, no disrespect to people who don't like this guy. I, One of the reasons why he's that the greatest. about to disrespect him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, no, no, no. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm saying I understand why you may not like him, but. One of the greatest cyclists of all time because of his, uh, the way his, he metabolized, uh, uh, he was able to retain oxygen in his blood is uh, Lance Armstrong. Well, his doping is now well recorded and legendary. And if he were not doing that, maybe he would not be one of the greatest cyclists of all time. 
But that's another conversation for another time. To answer specifically the oxygenation question. You just dissed yes. Chuck nice. I know, that. man. That was just <laughs> well, politely. Sorry. Was polite. Wait, Chuck, Charles was That's what I was saying. I said, if you mm-hmm. don't like him, I understand. Right. But, no, no, no. Okay. It's, Which it's had nothing not. to do with like. It was just the facts of the circumstances. But okay, go on. Go on, yeah. Charles. With oxygenation, it's very interesting. For swimmers, for example, very uh, asthmatics, people who have a hard time taking in air sometimes are told to swim to help them deal with that better. Some of the uh, world's greatest swimmers of all time actually have asthma. For example, Amy Van Dyken, who won many gold medals in swimming, uh, was asthmatic. And as a result, uh, for example, the way that she swam, she was able to use her muscles and work her, her body despite the fact there was a difficulty in her being able to take in air and thus so it's a, is it because you force your body and train it to breathe at these regular intervals so yeah. it's a it's really a breathing exercise at that level not only breathing yes but also the ability to do something very effectively even though you're not intaking more oxygen mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. okay so what about the sprints like the 50 meter uh, sprint they, they don't even come up for air so no, they don't that's yeah. right yeah, so, uh, so. yeah. Well, Hussein, Hussein Bolt is so good, he actually held his breath the entire time he was running, just to try and make it fair. <laughs> just to make it, just to make it fair. Tell, can't tell if you're joking or serious. But, he, was uh, still, he was still tying his shoes when everyone else began. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's true. Uh, the, the people who are doing the 50-meter sprint swims over the 20-ish seconds where they're working like crazy, they might come up for one breath. That's it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. All right. Keep it going. What else do we okay, have? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Well, we're not going to make you hold your breath for the next question. Well, I got to add something astrophysical here. So Earth's atmosphere didn't always have oxygen. Uh, it was likely carbon dioxide in its very earliest yeah. stages. And the whole ecosphere at the time fed on carbon dioxide and 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 released oxygen as a byproduct. That's and right. so um, the biggest climatic change ever was, was the conversion of our atmosphere from uh, CO2 based to oxygen. To, to Correct. Significant the oxygen. Great, the great oxygenation took hundreds of millions of years, and it was the most significant extinction event in the history of life on Earth. Mm. Oh, wow. So it, the, it was like, for us, uh, what global warming would be. Cool. <laughs> Very cool. possibly. <laughs> Very Except cool. global warming is happening on this time scale of human yeah, lifetimes, whereas that's yeah, happening yeah, to decades. take care of hundreds yeah. of millions of years. <clears throat> It's yeah, a way yeah, yeah. different scale. Yeah, so yeah, oxygen then way. enabled a whole other level and classification of metabolism to take place. That's right. It's like rocket fuel for for for, for macroscopic life. animals. Yeah. Yeah. But, Sweet. but that took it took forever to evolve that, mm-hmm, and everything mm-hmm. that didn't evolve that died out. Died. It very, it very is. Okay. Mm, okay. I give me another question. Give me another one. All right, here we go. This is uh, Michael Decola, mm-hmm. and he says, "Hey guys." Which sport of all sports, in your scientific opinions, requires the highest level of eye-hand coordination and why? Baseball, Ooh. hockey, tennis, badminton, ping pong? Oh, I love it. Let's, let's get to have... that. We got to take a quick break. Okay. Um, when we come back, we're going to fight over who thinks. Well, mm. clearly in soccer, there's no hand-eye coordination because they don't use their hands. So, no. <laughs> so you're, out of, you're, not in this con- you're not in this conversation. Keepers. <laughs> Oh, I'm I'm in this conversation, but it doesn't have to be about soccer. Okay, oh. when we come back, more Star Talk Sports Edition Cosmic Queries with my friend and colleague Charles Liu. We're back, Star Talk Cosmic Queries. Grab bag, all Cosmic Queries all the time. On, on this in this episode, I got Charles Liu with me. He's an astrophysicist with the City University of New York. And I've known this guy for 20 something years. And yeah. wh- wherever I am on the geek spectrum, he's beyond it. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's multiple <laughs> steps beyond. So that's why we have a synergistic relationship. All right. We, we, we work, work with one another. Thank you. <laughs> and as you said in the first segment, we complete one another, maybe. That's what it is. Uh, and Chuck, Chuck Nice <laughs> and Gary O'Reilly, let's do this. All okay. Right. So, what was that next question? Uh, uh, when we last, uh, when, before we left, Michael DeCola wanted to know which sport of all sports, in your scientific opinions, requires the highest level of hand-eye coordination and why? I'm going to vote real quick. And I would I would not have had this answer except for the Olympics I saw two days ago. 
And I have to say table tennis because, <laughs> oh my gosh, what the hell are they doing? How are they, how it is happening? And I can't even follow it. I'm dizzy just looking at them and they're actually playing the game. So I vote for table tennis, hand-eye coordination. I agree that that is very impressive, but my watching has led me to believe the thing that's even more crazy and even harder is fencing. I cannot uh, tell when people score. I just oh. can't see the blades. The it's, it, tips, it is the funny points, where they just sort they of move, remove the mask and cheer right. and say, what the hell just happened? They move <laughs> so fast. And, um. and we should also qualify, right, Neil uh, and Gary? I know you, you're about to say something mm. about this too. Um, there are many different versions of hand-eye coordination. There's the whole hand, like in fencing. There's individual finger craft. Right. There's the ability to move the arm in general uh, is a very complex system. So the term hand eye coordination is very complicated and there could be many correct answers to this question. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I kind of like the triple play in baseball that requires very high hand eye speed coordination and, yeah. and accuracy. Yeah. Um, but still the ping pong, my, my head is still bouncing back and forth. <laughs> from the three days ago the matches that I saw. Uh, so who else? So Gary, okay, soccer so, dude. Uh, um, it's, it's a you don't get a vote here because soccer- No, I have a non-scientific opinion. So I'm kind of just, <laughs> I'm, I'm running for fun as it were. Okay. Um, so it's a non-Olympic sport, but I have to push forward Formula One racing. To oh. be able to travel oh. at 200 miles an hour, coordinate everything in your ears that's coming from your team to assess intuitively the situation of your car on the road at those speeds whilst driving, I would push that forward. But there's an argument for and against, I'm sure. Oh. Yeah, my my argument you? against that is everybody's going 200 miles an hour. Right. So And, and so. the car is helping a little bit. <laughs> it's not going in a straight line. That's the thing with Formula One. It yeah. doesn't go in a straight line. You've got a oh, very, that's true. You very have different to steer. That's, that's true. Right. You yeah. do have yeah. to steer. Yeah. I, I tell you, man, I'm confused now because ping pong is a blurringly fast sport where you can't even follow the ball. And they're like the way they're. And I don't know how they create that much force to slam that little teeny ball that doesn't even. I can't even throw it. And they are <laughs> and they're smashing it so that it travels. Far. But then fencing is so incredible the way they're moving these foils in such a way that they're blocking each other and you can't even see it. And they're saying things like, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You are my father. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare, Prepare to, to die. die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, no, here it is. I think they should replace lightsaber. I mean, um, saber. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think they should replace fencing with um, lightsabers. All right, there it is. I'm now I'm watching all the time. Even oh. Olympics or not, you know? the, well, that'll be the, f the future of, of, right. of fencing. So, well, so lightsab Chuck, so you, lightsaber fighting in Star Wars is much more like the style of playing kendo, which is a, a sword fighting technique different. From oh yes, fencing. I like kendo. Yes, I know so kendo the, is great. It, a kendo yes. may well be a you use a cane. You use like point. like uh, yeah uh, yeah sticks. Uh, that yeah, re sticks, represent basically. swords, right. yes. So yes. instead of right. like cutting you in half with them, you just wind up hurting. Yeah, you each just other. end up with a knot on your head like this. <laughs> well, they're heavily <laughs> armored. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I don't know when Formula One's going to become an Olympic sport. That all right. That so what do you guys think about lobby. baseball? Baseball, sure. when baseball triple play is tremendously difficult. Yeah. Very hard for uh, the hand-eye coordination. A pitcher's got to throw the ball at 100 miles an hour, and, and then land the batter's got to take box. Yeah, right. a little tiny box, and then the batter's got to you know make sure that. Uh, you're taking a little stick and hitting this ball that's coming towards you at 100 miles an hour. Very complicated. So yeah, yeah. really, every sport has a case to make for mm. what is the most difficult hand-eye coordination. I don't think we can arrive today on a truly It's just not soccer because they don't use their hands. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> what is it with well, soccer in you? What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I love you, but yeah. in this case, I love no, you, but not got that much. For, I got Obviously. nothing for you. <laughs> well, <laughs> Next question. What do you got? need some serious stuff. All right, here we go. Next question's up, and it's Violeta, and it's broke down frenetically for us, and my mum, Izzy. Oh, we know Violetta. Violetta. Hey, we know Violetta. Right. Hey, so now, great is she still 11? Hear from you again. No, 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 here, here we go. Breaking news. <laughs> I am finally 13 years of age. She's a teenager. Yay! <laughs> so, She's a teenager. And I am writing to you from DC. Yeah, Violetta. And yeah. here we go. Right down <laughs> our lane. What are the weirdest sports to ever officially be part of the Olympic Games, past or present? And why, though? So has anyone I, got... I, I, I got to vote. I, I got to vote I, here. You I, go I, first, I gotta, Neil. I got to vote on, here. Man. So it has to be the tug of war. 
which was in the <laughs> first few Olympics. And they said, no, this is, we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> like, wow. So that was just kind of weird, right? The tug of war. So the rule was, as I understand it, everybody in the tug of war had to have a common um, uh, a profession and they have to dress in whatever it is that that profession required of them so that it was a unit. It wasn't just random people from your country. So it would be like all police officers or fire people or whatever. And so, <laughs> so it turned out the Brits kept winning it because they put their bobbies in it, you know, the police. And they have these long boots with steel shanks in the, at, at the heel. And so once they dug in their heels, you can't unpull that. And so they were winning every time and they just, they just gave up in the tug okay. of war. So wow. we broke we broke the sport of tug of war. Yeah, I saying? think so. Yeah. yeah, so tug of war. That well, was kind of weird. technology issue. Yeah. Yes, yes. They, they, they probably could have gotten around that, but that was kind of weird. And I would say the one of the weirdest sports we still have, not including all the really weird ones, just traditionally weird, the triple jump, I, I can't get around that one. I'm sorry. Huh? All right, no, that's got a, that's got that's so much physics in it. Let's I mean, not just me, let's let's not just jump once. Let's jump three times. And, oh wait, know. first hop first, and then it's like and wait, then who? skip and then it's jump. Skip. Yeah. Who, who, it's a happy who? it's a happy event. You get to skip in the, you get to skip in the <laughs> yeah. middle. All right, so my, okay, that's my vote. Go. All right, go, mine Gary. my obviously as I've said already non scientific is speed walking. Oh, that I, I, you know, I get walking around, but walking like that, um, you know, to all the so athletes, it's like go as fast as you can, just don't run, right? Just go as fast as you can and look almost as ridiculous mm -hmm. as you can doing it. Yeah. Um, to, to, with respect to every speed walker, nobody looks good speed walking. Nobody looks good. I don't but get walking it. is cool because the rule that you have to have one foot on the ground at all times is a mm. fascinating physical requirement. But that's not why they look weird. Right. They look weird because the, no, that's no, no, no. They look weird because the leg that's coming under your body has to have a locked knee. Yeah. The, the, so you, so good. yes, yes. So as oh. the, you put the, you put down your foot in front of you, as your body passes over that foot, your leg has to be straight. And so otherwise you ever see the, the posters keep on trucking? You could, you could, yeah. you could truck faster than you can speed walk if because you're not yeah, limited yeah, yeah. by the leg going straight under your body and so it's the straightening of the leg that shifts the hips up and down and gives you that jiggle wiggle waggle walk that, uh, that they've got it wow. just looks painful so chuck how about you what sport is the uh, very uh, quickly ribbon dancing what the <laughs> hell you mean no, rhythmic gymnastics that. rhythmic uh, gymnastics and not with the ribbon yeah the yeah, ribbon is yeah, only yeah, yeah. one event there's also the little ball that you could dance with too. Yes, that too. Oh, that goes oh, in with yeah, the ribbon yeah, dancing for yeah. me. Yeah. It's Rhythmic ridiculous. Gymnastics. Stop it is what I'm saying. <laughs> I think just it's cool. Stop. Yes, I, just stop, stop it <laughs> with your stupid <laughs> ball and your dumb ribbon. I like stop. what you say. Just yeah. stop. Yes. Just stop. Just stop. It. stop. No, and, I no. love the ribbon. Take your ribbon and wrap a gift. <laughs> <laughs> and take your ball and go to the beach. <laughs> and, and leave it out of the damn Olympics. And leave it out of the Olympics. Oh, okay. oh, no, no love for the, no, no, no love no. For the I, rhythmic I, gymnastics. I love <laughs> rhythmic gymnastics. I, well, I, got, uh, one, I got one more one more thing. It's not mm -hmm. the weird, but I have to confess my uh, urban ignorance. So I think I was maybe 20. Like embarrassingly, uh, probably a little younger, but still embarrassingly old the day I learned that the in water polo, uh -huh. never touching the ground. Never touch the bottom of the pool. That's right. right, because it's like seven, eight, nine feet down. And I said, what? And Those so, I, so I, I don't know, that does, I don't know if that counts as a sport that is weird, but I thought it was weird that they had to swim the entire time. I said, who would do that? <laughs> I guess that makes it harder. Yeah. If you're just trying the to throw the ball. Fitness of, the the yeah, physical that's... fitness of water polo uh, athletes uh, just off the amazing. I think I think it's an uncelebrated fact about what they do and how and why they do it. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right, let's okay. get one more before right. we take our um, next break. Go ahead, okay. Gary. Kaylee, Kaylee Sell. Um, hi, Chuck. Hi, everybody. 
Are there very many participants in the sports world working directly with scientists in the pursuit to figure out, it's a long question, by the way, um, pull up a chair, out of just (laughs) how durable the human body can be and what these athletes can accomplish? I've heard people saying we should have at least one perfectly average person competing against the world's best in the Olympics. So can we have some frame of reference and a laugh? So basically, Chuck, so basically, Chuck, this is what Kaylee Sell is saying. How much would they need to pay you, Chuck, right, to do gymnastics next to Simone Biles? And what is the statistical <laughs> likelihood you would survive to do another Star Talk episode? <laughs> oh, that's the rewording of the question. We yeah. will find out when we come back whether Chuck should be in the Olympics <laughs> so we can all laugh at him <laughs> relative to everybody else on Star Talk. We're back for our third and final segment of Star Talk. Sports edition, Cosmic Queries, Grab Bag Edition. I got Charles Liu. Charles, how do we find you on the internet? Uh, I tweet at Chuck Liu, C-H-U-C-K-L-I-U, and right. generally just find me around. Just, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just open some on, doors. There just he is. turn on the internet and <laughs> you'll find Chuck Liu. <laughs> 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 and 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 Gary, you're my three left feet. I think I am. Yes, and a yeah. bit like a bit like Charles, you, you turn on the internet and you can find me. <laughs> You'll be everywhere. Yeah, yeah. and and Chuck Nice is a, a Chuck Nice comic. If yes, I sir. Correctly. Thank you. Very good. Thanks Very so good. Much. So we left off. I forgot. Was this question directed to Charles Liu or Chuck Nice? This is a who, Chuck Nice question. The average person we want to see perform. Right. So they want to see just how good the best in the world actually are by putting what they are. Cont- this is Kaylee Sell, by the way. She is saying, right, how much do we need to pay? Chuck to do gymnastics next to Simone Biles, and what is the statistical likelihood you would that survive? Chuck will break. Do, yeah, that we will right. just completely trash. No, but I, I like the idea that we get a reminder of what is average. I, like that's a base a, that's level. A, that's a facet. So instead of the world record line on the pool, there should uh. be the Chuck Nice line. You know, moving <laughs> to where Chuck right. Nice would be. <laughs> yeah, which by the way would be a kiddie pool. So. <laughs> I know, but what it does, I mean, spinning that 180, what it does is make you realize just how good these athletes are. And when you yeah. say elite, I think in some instances it doesn't do them justice. Well, right, if, so, I ever, to, if I ever swam against an Olympic, uh, uh, in an Olympic meet, uh, the other swimmers would also have to wear swimmies. <laughs> to make it even for me. Because I bet you that that would like ruin them. Like actually swimming with swimmies. Will, will, will help you out. Are swimmies yeah, right. those little inflatable things that are on your yes, arm? Yes, they go on your arms. Okay, all right. That's what I was wondering. Swimmies. So here's the difference. There are events where you would break if you attempted them, but we all can walk and we know how to run and most of us know how to swim. So I think those are more typical of where you can put an average person in and see where they would land. Yeah. I think that would be an interesting um uh, exercise. Maybe but, Chuck do the, the balance beam or floor <laughs> exercises. Now, let me just bias. tell you, you could not pay me to do the balance beam oh. for two reasons. One, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know I, what they I, are. I actually, and there's two reasons. <laughs> <laughs> And I like them both. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. That's the that's, end of that joke right there. That's the end there. of that joke. Okay. So that's All right. And the, se- and the second thing is that I have a permanent case of the twisties. So, well, you look, know, put them All good- you have to do is a double pike dismount and you don't have to twist. That's true. Okay. So, so here it is, Chuck. I'm going to quote one of your brethren, uh, Stephen Wright. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> he, he says, I'm not afraid of heights. I'm afraid of widths. <laughs> <laughs> okay you gotta right. love that that was good yeah. that it's was not good. the fall it's the landing right there you go. right 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 all right let's get another one going here in our all third right. and final segment so what, what else you got you guys going back and forth yeah well yeah. this mm-hmm. is michael mean michael mean says hey neil and charles uh lucas my 10 year old science enthusiast wishes to know how many gymnasts jump so high during their floor routines not how many, but how how, how, how is it they do, jump so high? How now, do. He, he yeah. forgot the do. How mm. do gymnasts uh, jump so high uh, during their floor? He routines? didn't forget the do. You added a word that wasn't there. 
Okay, we should know uh, how gymnast jumped so high. That's all. <laughs> Don't be blaming it on the on Listen, Michael. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Michael didn't write this question the way I told him to. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, what? he should let his ten year old ask the question, not himself. Uh, We're answering okay. Lucas here, yes, not Michael. Lucas, okay. An excellent question, and Michael, thank you for phrasing the question for Lucas on Lucas's behalf. The answer is twofold. One is gymnasts have so much muscle power per cubic inch of their body that they're able to launch themselves in very, very effective ways, kind of like a way a basketball player can elevate above the rim. But in this instance, it's elevating their whole bodies in unusual and fast. Could it be that they're smaller? They're smaller. Being smaller helps. It's got to, because know. a flea can jump many times its height, that's but right. a hippopotamus can't. That's right. That's, so, <laughs> so that's, that's part of saying. it, right. But Imagine a jumping part, hippopotamus. That would be amazing. Oh, okay. I would no. love to see that. But the mm -hmm. second point, which sometimes <laughs> people don't know as much, is that- Actually, have you seen baby hippos? They're the cutest <laughs> thing. They do they jump are. with all four feet. Okay, yeah, go And on. they can cut you in half with their mouths. <laughs> Uh, they yeah. are they are powerful, powerful animals. Yeah, they're the, all jaw. Yeah. Okay. So go the, on. Go the, on. The other part is that a lot of people don't realize that in the floor exercises, there are springs under the floor. Mm -hmm. It is a very small amount of give and elasticity on the floor, just uh, in order to allow the athletes to have that extra push and see all the cool things that we get to see when they are performing their acts. In the so that means the energy that they give themselves by jumping high when they hit the, the, the pad again, that energy goes into the spring and goes back to them and it's not absorbed by anything. So that so there's no dissipation of the jumping energy. Now, apparently somebody wasn't content with the floor exercises and they introduced the trampoline to the Olympics. Oh. Okay. <laughs> wow. We need that more springs. Amazing, we're we're amazing not jumping sport. high enough. Yeah. Right, right. This guy's going 30 feet in the air. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's, uh, that's beautiful to watch. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep, keep it coming. Give me some more. All right. We, um, Thank you, Lucas. Last, ten year old Lucas. Yeah, uh, we're mm -hmm. going to fill one in, which kind of seems off topic, but I think we'll find a way to make this work. Josh has asked, "What fields? Because a physics graduate work in minus teaching. I wish to switch my degree to physics, but I am worried about the lack of job prospects." Well, we are a science sports show, so Charles, <laughs> do we have the answer here? We do. Wait, he's asking what if he's majors in physics? Is there a job? Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Wait. So the thing is, so he's th he's looking in, in the in the want ads or whatever mm -hmm. they are today, and say physicists needed. That's yeah. not how this works. Right. Oh no. Yeah. yeah Charles, this, take this take this from me. Go. Yeah. Um, and by the way, we're not Indeed. Com. <laughs> <laughs> Regrettably, we may not have the job to offer. But yeah. let me provide encouragement. Uh, as Neil was alluding to, physics is essentially the understanding of how the world and the universe work. My so, undergraduate degree is in physics. Yeah, I have one undergraduate degree in physics as well, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to astronomy and astrophysics. The point is that most people would love to hire a physicist for doing something other than teaching. For example, helping athletes be more effective in their athletic behavior because they know the physics of the human body, the physics of the equipment, the physics of the venue. What you need to do in order to take advantage of those opportunities in the world after you've attained a physics degree is to love what you do. Loving the physics and understanding what's happening allows you to extend yourself into different areas of the world which you might not have thought of was physics. And in the, in the process or literally change how those fields work. And uh, and, it's, and I may add, because uh, Charles and I com complement each other. Yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, because Charles and I complete each other. Let me add <laughs> that <laughs> physics is not so much a body of knowledge as it is insight into the operations of nature. So employers who know that do very well. And you know who are among them? Uh, Google has hired physicists. My wife has a PhD in mathematical physics and was hired by Michael Bloomberg, 
when he began his entire financial empire. She, when she was hired in there, he had only a, less than 100 employees. And he himself has degrees in math and physics. And when he became the youngest partner ever at Solomon Brothers, his mother said, but you're not using your physics degree. And then when he <laughs> left with $30 million and founded a company, a tech uh, info tech company, but you're not using your physics degree. Then he becomes a multi-billionaire. Then he runs a, you're not using your physics degree. The fact is he was using his physics degree every step All of the way. Oh, that's right. So All, shut up, all. mom. <laughs> no, no, never tell mom to shut up. Always he say. Chuck can sag because he's a comedian. He's allowed to say. <laughs> okay. All right. but, but the realization, yes, if you want to switch to physics because you really love it and you want to study the way the universe works, do it. And you will find the employment opportunities there opening up for you. Wait, wait, and if you're really just into just the physics for the physics sake, then you then you can be a physicist and be a, a research professor somewhere. Right. But if you don't want to teach and you don't want to do that, 99 other places will do it, will, will take you because you will see the world the way others do not as a juxtaposition of matter, motion, and energy. In fact, Charles and I are co-authors on a book published in the year 2000, which is basically about astronomy and the universe. In the year 2000. <laughs> However, the... Content was organized by the physics principles of matter, motion, and energy. And that was sort of an innovative way to think about information and knowledge and how it works to bring us the world that we know and understand and love. One universe at home in the cosmos. Yeah. I, I, time for like one more question. We got more, another question? Uh, this is from Roman Prekop. Is there any technology which could make, i.e. javelins, fly further? I think, Charles, you've got this. We may have touched on this. No, no I, I got this. I got this. It's All called right. rockets. It, Neil. You, there you, you put go. a rocket on it. <laughs> there you go. Low hanging fruit has been picked. What, what is it? But a, a what is a, a rocket? But a javelin with a rocket on. It? Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. So, Charles, didn't they already do this? Because no, the they did the opposite of this. No, no, what no. Did they do so. They moved the center of gravity by. There's a weight, so they moved it further back. And so that actually made the javelin throw l go f less distance. But there that's was because some because so the, su the, the the space in the stadium they couldn't contain no. the thrown javelin in the stadium without no. risking killing someone on the facing stands. Can you yeah. imagine someone? Yeah. In the, we in the we 5, only 000. lost we only lost four fans. Yeah, <laughs> and and an athlete in the five thousand meters that was taking. The oh, that happened to me <laughs> when he by. Yeah, you know it's yeah. So, imagine how, how that explaining that there was, one. There yeah. was also. Charles, wasn't there some sort of feathering on the tail of the javelin as well that they yes. were using to make it fly? So can we explain that That's as right. well? Well, aerodynamically speaking, when you have something in the tail of an object moving, it helps stabilize the motion and create a better trajectory. And what we always want to do when we're trying to throw things that are not round, or mm. even round to some extent, is to try to make sure it doesn't wobble or make too many changes in its profile to the air as it moves through the air. Because that'll, that that'll bring up more air resistance. An effective thing. Th that That's would create right. more air resistance, uh, I see. The, the fletching creates, yeah, a, a little bit of air resistance by existing, but what it does is, is it makes the net air resistance of the entire system much smaller. Cool, so, so this is why, to just go off sport here, uh, this is why you can throw a spiral uh, football farther than throwing it in any other sort of mm -hmm. uh, kind of trajectory. Right. right, a spiral goes farther because it maintains the same. What? How did you call it? Profile to the air as it moves as yeah. it moves through. Okay, very cool. Mm -hmm. so, so, but so we don't want them to fly farther. That's the point because we want to contain it within the stadium. <laughs> well, we can build bigger stadiums, yeah. but that's not cost effective. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's do one more. Was there one on on the Paralympics there? Yes, there was. Uh, this is a question from Peter Jacobs from Queensland, Australia. Shouldn't we allow Paralympic swimmers to wear prosthesis? Prosthesis. Ooh, mm. prosthesis, yeah. Prosthesis, thank you. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Interesting. Um, in my opinion, it would be fine if everyone wore the same kind of prosthetic that would allow them to be performing on a fair level playing field. That's kind of hard to know, mm. right? Paralympic athletes all need different kinds of prosthetics uh and so if you are going to that's part of the, the interesting challenge of designing the sports and right. how they would then, be then you wind up right. with a yeah a circumstance and and really um this is philosophical as opposed to physical but in my opinion 
when a Paralympic athlete uh, is performing, that person is whole. That person is not incomplete and needs a prosthetic to complete them. They are who they are. And so competing with that in mind, in that attitude, is, in my opinion, probably much more meaningful than athletic competition than prosthetizing everyone to be sort of a uniform in that way. Right. Damn, Otherwise, you'd be like, well, Mike, deep and Mike philosophical and, and, and moral philosophical and moral. Well, and, it. And, look, uh, no, yeah, look, Chuck, Chuck, we, does should, not, Chuck, nothing you said has any rebuttal. At all. Yeah, because, which is why I can't stand it because you couldn't, I can't make a joke. You can't even make a joke about it. <laughs> I can't, because what am I going to do with that? What you're saying is to say, let's put on a prosthetic means we have to turn you into us in order to watch you compete. And that's just Absolutely. wrong. Oh my right. gosh. It's not Chuck. necessary. Wow. What I mean, an Charles. Answer. What an answer. Charles, what an answer. <laughs> oh, Damn. Man. That is really good. Damn. And of course, uh, if you want to uh, cross over to one of our other postings, we interviewed the Archer. For the Paralympics, who does not have hands? Yes, and we learned the how he... archer is Matt Studsman, Neil. Yeah, we had we had him on mm, Star Talk, and yeah. and that was quite a show. Yeah. And he, and he was sitting there all proud, and how how he can you know uh, pull the bow, and he's got a family, and he works on his Corvette in his garage, wow. and so, yep. so so Charles, that's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you for thank you uh, digging into that uh, bit of uh, social cultural. Um, what shall we call that? Uh, a, a sense of who we are and a sense yeah. of what society can and should be. Ooh. Yeah. And you heard it here on Star Talk. All right, guys, we're going to call it quits there. Gary, Chuck, Charles, always great to have this, this trinity a of the three of you. Pleasure. What a pleasure. Um, pleasure. Working with me on this show. This has been Star Talk Sports Edition Cosmic Queries Grab Bag. And I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, your personal astrophysicist bidding you, as always, to keep looking up. 